everybody. I hope we've given you enough time to have a bit of a break and enjoy some uh, conversation and uh, interaction with each other if you're in the room with, um, with a group of people. Um, we're uh, on track as far as everything is um, concerned. So um, I hope that uh, you enjoy this next session. Uh, we're looking, you might have deja vu actually at the moment. Um, the next, um, our next presenter is um, Jason Hainsworth, who is um, the Director uh, of Community Correction Strategy in um, Corrective Services New South Wales. So um, he actually presented at our 2016 conference in Canberra uh, around domestic violence. So we won't talk about that. I've mentioned that a few times now. 2018 in Marichidor, where he introduced um, the uh, the. Uh, practice intervention guide um, or practice guide for interventions, beg my pardon, um, in uh, New South Wales um, and uh, the strategies around change in how we manage um, our clients in New South Wales. But today he's introducing the rat. Uh, it's not Templeton from Charlotte's Web, uh, but it could be, and my cat's ready to pounce somewhere in the room. Um, but at the moment, I'd like to introduce you to Jason. Um, Jason, over to you. Thanks, Yolanda. All right, hi everyone. Um, I'm gonna get straight into it because uh, uh, I've got a bit to cover and not a lot of time. Uh, so hopefully everyone can see my screen there, my, my presentation, um, that's me. I'm the Director of Strategy for Community Corrections uh, and I'm gonna talk about the risk assessment uh, tool today. So the first thing that uh, I want to quickly recap is the risk principle. So we all know risk needs responsivity um, because that's really what the, the RAT fundamentally is about. Uh, it's about uh, improving our adherence or increasing our efficiency in adhering to the risk principle. So the, the key thing, I mean, you all know, risk principle prioritise resources to our highest risk. Um, I've added in there finite resources because that's one of the key components of the RAT, which I'll get into uh, shortly, is how we manage our resources to meet that risk principle. Uh, we also, of course, have minimal intervention for low risk. And just for context, in New South Wales, the main risk tools that we're using are the LSIR, which I'm assuming that you're all fairly familiar with, um, as well as the CIA, which is a, a local assessment tool for assessing the impact of offending. Um, we also do use uh, sex offender specific tools, but those are the two main ones. Now, some of the challenges with implementing the risk principle effectively, um, which we're trying to address through the RAT, uh, which I want to go over first, are firstly that risk changes over time. Now, what do I mean by that? So let's say we've got two medium risk offenders. Uh, so red offender, blue offender. Now, both of these individuals have scored 30 on the LSIR. So the question is, is their risk today the same? Now, if we take a bit of a closer look at these two offenders, we can see one of them has been supervised for one month and the other one has been supervised for four months. So let's assume that the assessments were done at about the same time. Now, they're both scoring the same. We would say they have the same risk of reoffending over a 12 month period. But what about today? Now we can unpack that a little bit more in terms of what's, what that looks like when we start looking at populations. Now, of course, again, you're, you'd all be aware, a risk assessment is about group assessment. It's not about individuals. So when we think about risk assessment, we have to think, what does this mean for a population? So let's say instead of our two offenders that are one month and four months, we've got 10. Now, obviously this works better when you've got hundreds or thousands of offenders, but this will just make the maths a little bit easier to follow along. Okay, so we've got 10 identical offenders. We're gonna say that they all have a 40% chance of uh, reoffending in the first 12 months, which means that four out of the 10 are gonna reoffend. Okay, now one of the key parts of risk assessment is that we don't know which four. So we know that uh, an individual belongs to a group, but we don't know which the individual specifically is going to reoffend. Um, and that's key to where we're heading next. Okay, four months later, two out of those 10 offenders have reoffended. So we've still got 10 identical offenders with a 40% risk of offending. We know that four will reoffend, and now we know that two of them actually have. And we know who two of those four are. So this changes our equation a little bit. We can take those 
two uh, known offenders out of the picture, which means we have eight unknown offenders remaining. So two more are going to reoffend because two already have. If we recalculate the risk for the remaining eight, we end up with a 25% risk of reoffending. Okay. Now, there's some important caveats here. This is just illustrating sort of the, the principle, the, the logic behind uh, where we headed with the rat. Uh, it's just an example. It's not real data. I'll get to the real data shortly. And of course, you might notice we're talking about risk in the first 12 months, um, it, which is not the same as the risk in the next 12 months. Um, I'm not going to go into that and unpackage what that means too much. Some of you might have picked up on that. Um, but either way, the, the basic principle is the same that the longer somebody's on uh, supervision, the more information you have and the less uncertainty there is around who is going to succeed and who is going to fail. Um, because as, as people reoffend, we have increased certainty or increased knowledge of who the reoffenders are, um, which also gives us more concrete information around who the, the non-reoffenders are going to be. Okay, again, remembering risk assessment is about statistical uh, reliability. It's not really about individuals, okay, that's key. Um, but one of the challenges here, so I've just modeled how that might look over a four month period, um, even though it's just an example, but we're only reapplying the LSI RCI every 12 months. And of course, practically speaking, to reapply risk assessments continually, uh, it's just not practical. All you're doing, all you're doing is, is reassessing offenders rather than managing them. The other challenge of using a tool like the LSIR um, can be that you've got five risk categories uh, for quite a large spectrum of offenders. So low through to high risk, um, but you know, across 35,000 uh, offenders, which is roughly what we've got in New South Wales, that could mean that any single category of risk uh, has thousands of offenders in it, which makes it very difficult or makes it more challenging when you're trying to allocate resources effectively. So that's our first sort of key challenge. Okay, the next key challenge that I want to talk about is that, uh, so our risk changes over time, but so can our resourcing. Uh, and in particular, that our, our demand or I guess lack of resources can change very quickly, whereas the additional resources that we might need to manage that demand can take a lot of time. Okay, so I'll give you an example of what I'm talking about. Uh, in New South Wales, we had very large increases in workloads since 2019. So some of you might be aware we had large uh, sentencing reform in late 2018. The impact of that reform was much more substantial than what we'd expected. So we did get large amounts of additional resourcing uh, to, to help manage the sentencing reform. Um, it's just that the increase outstripped that, uh, that resourcing. Okay. So we did some work to, to model our requirements for additional funding. We did that in late 2019. Uh, I, I should say we, it's an ongoing process. We're doing that all the time. Um, but for this particular example, um, the 2021 funding needs were modeled in late 2019. Uh, we only got informal approval in October of 2020. So almost a year later. Now, obviously some of the additional delay here was due to COVID. Um, but nonetheless, that's, that's how long it took. Uh, we then had the training intake in early 2021. Our funding wasn't actually formally confirmed until 2021, which again, makes decision-making really difficult. And we didn't have any new staff on the ground until mid 21. So you can see, even though in the end, we did get significant additional resourcing, it took quite some time uh, between identifying the demand, the spike in demand, which happened quite quickly, quite suddenly, uh, to when we actually got the resourcing to support that. Okay. Um, the other sort of key thing to bear in mind here is that even if you do have significant uh, state resourcing, that doesn't always translate to local uh, resourcing or local, local workload uh, issues. So for instance, if you've got a small office, maybe you've only got four or five CCOs and uh, two of them take unplanned leave, that's nearly half your staffing. Uh, you can have fluctuations from local courts or uh, policing practices that can cause sudden spikes. So you have a local police operation, um, a change in magistrate. Um, those sorts of things can, can have um, very rapid impacts on uh, local demand. Uh, and then, of course, 
your vacancies are, you might have say you know, 95% of your positions across the state are filled, but that doesn't really help the location that has 30% vacancies, you know, that's making up a larger chunk of that. Um, so we need a, what we're trying to do here is adapt our risk assessments to account for these rapid changes as well. Uh, the last sort of key challenge that I want to touch on is it can be difficult to distinguish risk from chaos. Um, this is more of a offender management, case management thing. So I think that those first two challenges are really about managing the numbers, uh, whereas this last one is more about managing the person. So let's take one of those individuals that we're working with. Uh, let's call them John. Okay, John is unemployed. He drinks regularly. He has mental health problems. He's not taking his medication. He frequently fights with his partner. He smokes pot whenever he can afford it. Now, is John high risk? So let's assume that John has been supervised for two years and has not reoffended. When we started working with him, he used to offend every few months. So initially he probably was high risk or at least was assessed as high risk on the LSIR. But I wanna ask another question. What if John had never committed an offense? So everything else that I've just described about John is the same. So he drinks a lot, he's got mental health issues, um, he fights with his partner. And uh, just to be clear, we'll, we'll define fighting as, as verbal arguments, um, you know, the usual sort of household conflict, not, uh, not any violence um, or coercive control or any of that sort of thing. If he'd never committed an offence, should he be managed by the justice system? So one thing that I think, I, I, uh, and I think it's a difficult problem to solve, is it's not a crime to be an alcoholic. It's not a crime to have mental health problems. It's not a crime to be an asshole. Um, there are lots of individuals in our communities that have all of the characteristics that I've just described um, that John has that don't offend. And it, if we came across one of those individuals, we would say, well, that's not appropriate for a criminal justice intervention. Um, the problem is some, sometimes those characteristics do lead to offending. Um, so individuals uh, harming, hurting other people. So John might be a domestic violence offender, for, for instance. And one thing that I, I think can happen is particularly with our higher risk offenders, it can be hard to start to tell apart when somebody is offending versus when they're not, if those same characteristics are present. So one thing that I would sort of say that you could think about there is an offender commits offences. That's why we call them offenders. Otherwise, it's somebody with a mental health um, issue. And you know, we can go into that whole debate around are they offenders, clients, uh, whatever. But the reason that we come to that term offender is because of the offences. So the question is, at what point does somebody cease to be an offender after they've stopped committing offences? And if we have somebody that has a long history of offending behaviour um, that is that is committing a lot of offences, hurting a lot of people, damaging property, whatever it is they do. But those same characteristics such as mental health problems, um, substance abuse issues continue. Sometimes it can be hard to miss the fact that their offending has actually stopped you know, or has significantly reduced at least. So that's sort of the, the last challenge that I want to... Um, Sort of reflect on um, and what I'd like to sort of ask is the question at what point can we tell John that so when can we say to John actually you know what all of this stuff is still going horribly in your life you're still chaotic you're still all over the place but you're actually doing quite well when we talk about your offending okay so that's sort of the three key challenges that I certainly was thinking about when we started looking at development of the rat. So what are the solutions? And yep, we've got this new thing called the risk assessment tool or the rat. Um, it's basically uh, an enhancement is probably the best way to think of it rather than a replacement. So this isn't, this isn't a new tool in the way that, um, you know, coming up with a new LSIR is a, is a new tool. It's more a, an enhancement to give more precise information around what our risk is. Uh, 
It updates weekly. Uh, so it's an automated process that uses data from our offender management system, OIMS. Uh, it adjusts as new data arrives. So I've talked about uh, the reduction in risk that happens over time um, you know, if nothing else happens. So it, all things being equal, offenders on supervision, they start on day one, um, there's no further offending, uh, the risk declines. Uh, but obviously there's other things that we need to think about as well. So, you know, if we think to our 10 offenders, two re-offended, you know, what do we say about the risk of the two individuals that re-offended? What happens there? Um, so the, the rat takes that stuff into account. Uh, we get information from police that comes into our offender management system. So when, when we know when there are new arrests, um, obviously offenders can be reassessed. So we take into account reassessment data um, and that the tool constantly adjusts and updates uh, as that new information comes in. Uh, it provides a statewide view at both local and individual level. And that's, this is probably key to the RAT. Uh, so everything, all of the information that's in the RAT is baselined against the state. And I'll explain a little bit more about what that means in a second. Um, it prioritizes workload support. So I won't go into any detail about that today, but we've got a remote service delivery team um, that's like our relief staff that provides support to uh, different offices around the state that are having workload pressure. Uh, we use the risk assessment tool as a way of identifying where the priority for that support needs to be. Um, as I've said before, this is really about just maximizing the risk principle and practice. Uh, I'll, I'll show you a little bit what that looks like uh, at the end, um, but very much making sure that the highest risk as at today um, are flagged on the report uh, rather than saying, you know, highest risk over 12 months, highest risk week to week. Um, and again, um, I've, I've talked about the funding process, which I'm not going to go into uh, a, a huge amount of detail uh, on, but this is directly linked. Uh, or this, the, the resourcing model um, and the risk assessment model, which is not just the RAT, um, but the other systems that we use, like our, our workload management model, uh, contributes to ongoing funding models. Um, so I'll touch on that a little bit more in a second, uh, just because it might make more sense when I'm explaining how this actually works. Okay, uh, it's dynamic, uses real data. And what that looks like is we take all, all the, the basis for, for that information, uh, is real data from offenders that have been managed through the last few years, so 2017, 18, 19. We capture all of their risk assessment data, offence type. Um, so as you know, uh, different types of offen offending uh, or offence categories have different risks, even if the risk assessment comes out the same. Uh, we look at time on supervision. That's a key component of this. Uh, prior re-arrests and offending, that which has occurred while on supervision. Um, one of the other things that's really important uh, to flag here is that the reoffending that we're looking at is not just any reoffending, but what we call personal property or serious drug offending. Uh, so in New South Wales, we have a primary priority for reducing reoffending uh, or reducing adult reoffending, but it's not any reoffending. So for instance, minor regulatory traffic offending is not a premium priority. So when we run these numbers, we're actually looking at those offences that are the, within the premier's priority, which are uh, the shorthand that I like to describe it as is the, offend, the offending that the community cares about. So for instance, drug possession is not a premier's priority offence either um, because drug possession in of itself is not something that causes significant harm to the community. There might be other consequences of that, just like alcohol abuse um, down the track, but the, the possession in itself causes no harm or minimal harm per, per incident. Uh, so for context, uh, I think on our uh, latest uh, national drug use survey, uh, we've got approximately 1 million people in New South Wales that have used illicit substances in the last 12 months. Uh, we've only got 35,000 offenders um, on supervision. Okay. So anyway, we, we grab all of this, this data and we look at what was the actual uh, re-offending. So this key to this is that it's the same data that we have for a caseload today. So it's almost like going back to mid 2017, 2018, 
and creating the caseload that we have today and then seeing who actually reoffended. What were the actual rates of reoffending at that point in time? So not just how many people reoffended after they started their order, but how many people that you know, scored 30 on the LSIR that were six months into their order and hadn't been rearrested uh, reoffended in the next 12 months. Okay, so we're really trying to estimate what's the risk today, not what is the risk the last time we assess them. Okay, and that's that's the key difference between uh, what we used to do uh, in terms of our LSIR CA assessment and what we're doing now. Okay, so here's some actual data rather than some sort of made up to show you how the logic works uh, examples. So this is showing you the rates of reoffending by LSIR. So along the bottom there, the 10, 12, 14, 16, that's just score on the LSIR. And then you've got three different lines showing you, uh, first of all, what's the rate of reoffense in the first six months? What's the rate of reoffense in the next seven to 12 months? And what's the rate of reoffense in, in 13 to 18 months? And I should sort of note that that's for offenders that didn't reoffend. So if they made it to seven to 12 months, what, were the re what was the reoffending rate after that? Okay. And you can see quite significant differences between, particularly at the high end um, of the risk spectrum, um, that if somebody manages to remain out of trouble for an extended period of time, their odds of succeeding further increase significantly, um, much less of a difference down at the low end. Okay. Uh, now, the RAT takes into account a whole bunch of other variables uh, which are not uh, shown here, but this is just to give you an idea of the degree of difference that can, can occur uh, between say somebody that's high risk. If we look at you know, somebody scoring around 40 on the LSIR, their initial risk in the first uh, six months can be up around the 45% mark uh, chance of reoffending. Again, remembering that this is just uh, personal property, serious drug offending, uh, reoffending. Uh, down to around about 15% if they've managed to last more than a year. Okay. So you can see the, the, the difference there, quite substantial. Okay, so how does that work? Um, so we take an example, tier one, medium risk offender, LSIR 28, common assault, supervised for nine months, last arrested seven months ago. Um, if we use the historical data, we know that somebody that looks like that on average uh, would have committed 16% or a, a group of offenders with those characteristics would on average 16% of them would have committed a personal property reoffense in the following 12 months as of today. Uh, we also calculate serious uh, violent or sexual reoffense, so the AOABH upwards, okay, and 6% for, for that. Now, if we look at somebody who has almost the same characteristics, but was just recently rearrested for another offence, um, yeah, a little bit like our graph, we can see significantly increased risk uh, for further reoffending within the next 12 months. So 41% up from 16, 10% um, for a serious sexual or violent offence up from six. Okay. All right, so that's sort of the basic idea of how we assess the, the risk uh, by using historical data of, of reoffending, controlling for all of those factors. The next key part of this, uh, which is really critical to the RAT, is linking it to resourcing. Okay. So what we do first of all, is we sort our entire population from most risky uh, down through to least risky. Now I've gone from 42% to 22%. Our least risky offender is, is much lower than that. Um, it's just for illustrative purposes. Um, so don't pay too much attention to the actual numbers. It's just the concept. Um, we then add the amount of hours that it would take uh, to manage that offender. Uh, so this is based on the workload model that's used in uh, community corrections in New South Wales. And we start working out, well, if it takes nine hours to manage our most risky offender, then it takes nine hours to manage our second most risky offender. It would take 18 hours to manage our top two. We can, you can sort of see how it goes then um, below that. 
six hours for offender three, which means that we're in up to 24 hours in total, 29s and so on. And so we start adding that up down the entire state. Okay, so for argument's sake, let's say we only had 30 hours worth of resources, so 30 hours worth of staff time that we could allocate to managing these offenders. Uh, who would we manage? So pretty straightforward. We just go up for our top 30. So in this case, 29, we stop at 29 hours because we don't have enough to go over to the next one. And, and that's who we manage. And in New South Wales, you might be aware, uh, we have a process for suspending supervision. Uh, so where we don't actively assign offenders to, to caseload, we just put them um, in a, an administrative caseload where we get notifications if there's re-arrests or things like that, um, but we're not allocating staff time to it. Uh, and we start suspending from there. Okay, if we had 40 hours, we'd go down a little bit further. Okay, we then take that approach and apply it to the entire state. So at any given time, there are probably more offenders uh, that are on caseload, uh, or sorry, that we could be managing. So we've got 35,000 offenders in total. We don't manage all of them because we don't have the resources. So how do we decide which ones we focus on? Exactly the same approach. First of all, we take out anybody, you know, uh, home detainees, uh, for instance, pre-release work, things that we can't suspend. We take them out of the mix, add them into our uh, resourcing uh, pool. And then we do that offenders sorted by risk. If we get, uh, we, we cut off at wherever we run out, run out of resources. Um, the benefit of this model is if our resources increase, we can just, start adjusting, the, the model automatically adjusts to take account of that. Okay, so extra funds, we can manage more. All right, so the, the cutoffs for the risk assessment tool automatically adjust depending on the resources that we have available and that hierarchy of riskiest to least risky offenders. Okay, so it's designed to be used at a state office and individual caseload level because we take all of that statewide information um, and then we pop it into uh, tools that can be accessed locally. Um, so you'll see there uh, Office A has a couple of offenders that should be suspended if we use the statewide benchmark. Um, they could just reallocate their, their resources uh, and move those, those red offenders up onto active caseload, you know, do a bit of a, a reprioritization. Uh, whereas Office B is already fully up, uh, fully loaded. Um, so if we're looking at where we're going to provide uh, resource support, we're going to provide it to Office B because they've got no room to move, whereas Office A um, can reprioritize to make sure that the highest risk offenders are getting the most support. And again, this is just risk principle in action. Um, resources prioritized to our highest risk. Okay. It doesn't matter whether our resources increase or decrease, the calculations will automatically adjust and they ensure that we've got equitable distribution of whatever limited or excess of resources that we have, they're always going to be automatically adjusted to prioritize the highest risk as at today. Okay. Lastly, and I think just as importantly, the case management element. Okay, so we want to highlight positive changes, not just focus on negative risk. Um, so obviously resource prioritization prioritization is focused towards highest risk, um, but we also make sure that the tool is identifying um, offenders that are doing well as well. So here's a couple of examples um, that appear on our actual reports. Uh, so this is an instruction that would appear on a report that officers can access for their own caseload. Uh, and it says, Martin was assessed as high risk and does not appear to have been arrested or returned to custody in five months. Normally, almost half of all offenders with a similar risk profile would have been arrested or returned to custody by now. Okay. Yeah, another example, uh, different, slightly different situation. Uh, Brett was assessed as high risk, but does not appear to have been arrested or committed any significant offenses in 11 months. He is doing well given the average for the risk level. So again, you remember back my example, John, the question I asked, at what point do we tell John he's doing well? Well, now we've got a, a report that helps prompt um, officers to say, look, this person might still be a chaotic, but they're actually doing pretty well. Okay. Uh, that's what the actual report looks like. Um, so you can see there, you know, just all the basic information. Um, this, this one's been de-identified, so they're all made up um, mins and names. Uh, 
but the instructions uh, and the data are real. So it just tells you that instruction. There's, there's a whole bunch of other stuff that the report does, which I won't go into here, um, but provides that feedback around what the risk level is doing, how the offender compares to other offenders in the state by giving the state percentile, um, and then the overall risk levels. Okay, you'll notice they're all sitting at 95% and 39%. Um, that's because the report is ordered highest risk to lowest risk, so they're all just very close to each other. Okay. So closing up, <clears throat> the risk assessment tool uh, or the RAT, it's a refinement, it's not a reinvention. So it's, it's doing things that we've always tried to do. So our, our workload management guidelines have always said, uh, when you're trying to, when you're assessing risk, look at offenders that have been on caseload for the longest period of time without uh, being re-arrested, re-offending, um, breached, um, and look at reassessing them. The RAT just helps speed that process up and, and focus uh, more on both the negative and the positive. So it'll, it'll flag offenders where the risk looks like it's increased as well um, and helps give that guidance so that the officers are not having to keep track of those slow changes over time. It helps improve consistency of resource distribution, um, making sure that resources are targeted where there is highest need in terms of risk. Um, and also providing guidance to ensure all locations are managing uh, caseload consistently or as consistently as we can. Okay. It's still relatively new. We're still developing it. We're still improving it. We're still ironing out a few bugs. Um, but in a nutshell, that is where we're up to with, uh, with our risk assessment in New South Wales. Thank you. Thanks, Jason.